Bless God. I think y'all y'all missed Bible study. We already had. <laughs> Our bishop blesses for a few minutes. But again, welcome to another live stream uh, at Bread of Life East. My name is Minister Alton West. I'm here with my minister and brother. Raymond Crockett. Ram, Raymond Crockett in the building, man. How you feeling today? I'm feeling good, man. Good, man. Good, good. I'm Dive glad. in. Amen. Amen. Good, good. Yes, sir. Man, we, we, me, and, uh, me and Brother Crockett was talking about some things, and I believe the Lord put on my heart uh, the subject matter. Uh, Bishop was talking a little bit about it, actually, before everything uh, came on, uh, because we do live in a day of uh, chaos and confusion and uncertainty. Uh, you know, we find people bouncing from one platform to platform, uh, uh, this person or that person, whatever rumor, whatever new revelation or whatever it is, and they're driven by this desire to actually be connected to God. Uh, so that kind of leads us to the root scripture of what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, the name of our study is going to be, Who Do You Say That I Am? Because I believe that, that the problem with uh, the church, because we're the spearheaders, we're supposed to be the place where people come to find God. But what's mm -hmm. happening is, is that we don't, we don't as a whole know who he actually is. We get a lot of believers that come to church and they are learning about God, but they're never crossing that threshold to where you're actually getting to know who he really is. So we get a lot of people that are getting a lot of information, but, but inside of themselves they're not being informed or interchanged. What's happening is, is they're getting information from external places, and the more that they stockpile this information, the more puffed up they get in pride yeah. because they haven't met the God that's actually going to humble them. Amen? Yeah. Well, we're going to be talking about that today. Our root scripture is going to be Matthew 16, 13. Matthew 16, no, say it, 13, and we're going to read the verse 20. And before we get into uh, reading, uh, Brother Raymond, you want to pray for us? Yes, sir. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we just love you so much. We just thank you for this opportunity to assemble together as yes, saints God. to hear the word of God today. Yes, that Lord. it be, be, may be established in our hearts and yes, our spirits, Lord. And it will take root and begin to multiply and produce a mighty yes, harvest God. of truth and righteousness Lord yes, of God, Lord. and equip us to be prepared to go out and, and speak to someone what thus says the Lord and have something ready to say at that time when they question it, because there's a lot of people questioning what's going on, as Mr. Alton said, Lord, and I just bless the people now today that their hearts and minds will be clear to receive, and we just give you all the glory in the na precious name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. All right, so we got Matthew 16, 13. It says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Go ahead. And it says, And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said unto them, But whom do ye say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Look at what Jesus says here. And Jesus answered and said unto him, said unto him, Blessed art thou, son, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Go ahead. And I say unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus Christ. I asked myself the question, why did... Why was Jesus so interested in asking him? This was years ago. I'm like, Jesus knew who he was. Why was it important for him to even stop and ask Peter, who did he think that he was? Or the disciples, who do you think that I am? The reason why, why, why God was asking these questions is because God, he himself knows who he is, but he wants to establish that his children have revelation of who he actually is. 
But what's happening is, is we're in a day and age where we are not getting the revelation of who God is. So we don't really have the, the reverential fear we need. Right. We don't have the faith that's necessary. Amen. And when we go to approach God, we don't approach him as God. So our prayers are hindered. So what happens is, is we end up being a powerless church. Right. The Bible says here that, that, that him knowing who God actually was, what, was what released the keys to the kingdom to him. That's right. Amen. What he's saying is that that's your power. When you understand and know who God actually is, right. it unlocks a power to you. Right. So whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Yeah. But what we're doing is we're, lot, we're, we're, we're operating as, or looking at a church that has access or is supposed to have access to a house, but they're being locked out because they don't have the keys. The keys of the kingdom happens when you understand who God actually is. Amen? You want to touch down? Amen. So, yes, the, uh, that, that revelation of Jesus Christ really lays the foundation of, of the church in which all the framework of, of Christianity is built. Yeah. Okay, so uh, that revelation that Peter had, uh, Jesus said, uh, upon this rock, you know, mm -hmm. that I would build my church. And, yeah. that, and that was the beginning of the church, the foundation of the church. And the framework uh, would come from there. Mm -hmm. and, and because he said, blessed art thou that, you know, flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, yeah. but my Father which is in heaven, yeah. uh, shows that the scripture is true, that no man comes to the Son except the Father first drawn. Mm -hmm. And so human reasoning and, and understanding cannot... Uh, discern this revelation come on man. it I has like to come by the spirit amen and when you have the and when you hear you know when he as peter you know would walk with jesus and heard mm -hmm. things and those this faith was being built up yeah and it was through that 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 spiritual force of faith when he and when jesus asked him he by the power of the holy spirit could answer that question the way he did yeah and that's what it's going to take is when you're, when you're hearing the gospel when it's being preached mm -hmm. and that faith comes alive mm -hmm. in yeah. you, that is God drawing you. Yeah. And you cannot forsake that. You cannot push that away. That's why I'm saying a lot of people, because people mm -hmm. deny yeah. what God is doing and because you cannot come to God in your own terms. Yeah. You cannot come to Christ in your own terms. Right. You know, and that's why we always talk about today's today. Yeah. Because when you hear the word, when you know God is drawing you, mm -hmm. don't deny it. Because yeah. you can't come to God anytime you right. can. Right. And a lot of people miss miss that miss that revelation. Right. Because they're still carnally minded. And you know, the carnal mind cannot discern the spiritual things of God. Amen. Amen. I'll Amen. Oh, no, that's that that's a blessing. What I like about this text too is that it tells us about the access to the power. But then it also links that revelation to your identity in Christ. What did Christ say? Christ said, now I call you Peter. What he's doing is he's establishing his identity. So what we're looking for, what I see in the church today is a lot of people assuming position to be identity. They'll say, you know what, I don't, I don't know who I am in God unless I got a microphone. That's what makes me significant in God, right? They'll say, I don't know who I am in God unless I've got an audience surrounding me. That means that I am significant with God. But this is before Peter ever got thrusted into any type of ministry. Right. He, said that, he said that I call you Peter. He said, I'm going to establish my church based on this principle. It's not establishing the, the church on Peter himself. Right. What he was establishing the church was based on this principle. What was the principle? He's saying that people who get a revelation of who I actually am are going to be adopted. Yeah, right. But there's a lot of people that don't know who God really is. That's how come there's such a division in the churches because there is a remnant that have, said, that, that have seen God, that have been touched by God, whose lives have been changed by his power, who understand the power of his sanctifying blood, who understand the power of deliverance and the changing of the life and mind and the miracle of salvation. There are people who have encountered that, but then there's other people that try to grab a hold of it, like Raymond, like Raymond was just saying, they're trying to grab a hold of it by knowledge. They think, oh, if I know enough, I'm going to get it. 
If I get enough information or if I sit around enough, it's just going to drop on me. What he said was that his faith was actually sparked. Something actually called yes. out from the inside of him yes. and said, man, okay, this ain't just a man. Right. And I think that a lot of people are approaching a, a Jesus or church as if he is a man. When they look at Jesus, they think about some dude that just died on the cross 2,000 years ago because they don't know him. When they come to church, they think of it like a good luck charm or, or the good mojo that's going to get you through the week. That's because you don't know what this really is or what it's actually about. The Bible says that there's some power that falls on his church. He said there's an anointing to destroy yokes that falls on his church. He says that there's a binding that's released to you so powerful that if you bind it in the earth, he will ratify it in heaven. Amen. If that's not happening in your life, Look, I believe that proof is in the pudding. That's how I came. When I came to God, I said, hey, look, man. I said, I'm not here to play no games, God. I said, I don't know you like that, but I want to. I said, God, I, don't, I can't sit up here and say that I love you like that, but I, but I want to. I believe if I get to know you, I will. Right. And God started to reveal itself to me. I didn't want to come to church and play the game. Right. I didn't want to, want to, I didn't want to like, like Bishop was talking about on Sunday. I didn't want to waste Sundays sitting in here, you know, watching choir sing and, and you know, and, and, and just yelling out amens and not actually encountering him. That was not going to get it for me. That was not going to work for me. I believe that it, the same God that called me was authentic, yes. authentically real in his ability to save and his ability to change your mind. So I pursued God. I said, God, I need you to change me. Yeah. And, and what's happening is, is we're not putting God on assignment in our life. What we're doing is we're coming to church, but we're not putting ourselves up for grabs when it comes to God. You're not saying, God, I need you to work on me. Work on my heart, God. Work on my mind. You're not giving him permission to do so. God is not going to break in and just change you. That's not what he does. You have to ask God. God, do something new in me and show me yourself, God. Reveal yourself unto me, God, so I have a real connection with the true and living God. Give me revelation. You might say, man, I'm coming to church. I'm coming to church, but I don't think I know Jesus. Mm. He's not trying to hide from you. He's not trying to hide from you, but he's only going to move when your heart is pure. Yeah. See, sometimes we think we can dupe God, ah. right? We think we can trick him. We think, oh, man, if I come in, <laughs> let me say this. <laughs> all the years of ministry, I've seen people come down to altars all across this city. I'm talking about and cry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oceans, like I said, oceans, lakes, rivers of tears. <laughs> and no sooner than they leave the door are they back into the same situation that they was crying about. And you might say, why is that? People have to ask that, that, that literal question, why is that? And is that how Jesus actually operates? Does he operate this way? And, and a lot of times we see people quoting the scripture where he found the lady caught, caught in adultery. And the Bible says that, that he stopped the guys that were going to stone her. Right. And he said, listen. He who, who is out sin cast the first stone. We, we, we start on that part. But we don't go to what he told her. He told her. He said, who is thine accusers? He said, where they at? They was all gone. That's the time people to clap, say, oh, man, praise the Lord. He delivered her. Right. But then he turned to her and said, go and sin no more. Look at what he said after that. Lest a worse thing come upon you. Look at what he said. You, you got to understand, in order to understand the gravity of what he was saying in this text, you have to understand the gravity of what stoning was. When they, when they picked stones, they specifically picked the stones to, to inflict the most amount of damage. <laughs> stoning was worse than any shooting that you would have seen. Any shot victim, you could have walked in the house and seen everybody shot. It's not the same result as what happens during a stoning. During a stoning, the flesh is literally tore from your skin from rocks until either you bleed to death or you're unconscious. And then they would stand over the victims with heavier rocks and, and crush the skull. 
This wasn't something that was just a pat, something that serious. Jesus said that if you go back and do what it is that I delivered you from, something worse than this is going to happen to you. That's good. So the Jesus that we've made, the Jesus that we created, is not the Jesus that was walking back then. The Jesus that a lot of the church is serving is not the authentic Jesus of the text. Yeah, he's a savior. Yeah, he's a redeemer. But the Bible also says he's a judge. Yes, he is. And, and when you look at a judge, a judge is always scaled in how permanent or how, uh, uh, or how uh, uh, intricate he is with handing out judgment to those that have sinned or those who have broken the law. If you see somebody that is guilty of murder and he done went on a mass murdering spree, and, that ju and he sits in front of the judge, and the judge said, you know what, we're going to give you 90 days parole. The courtroom would erupt. People would be trying to kill the judge because they would say that he's unjust. Exactly. He's unfair and he's unthorough. Yeah. If Jesus is the ultimate judge, that means his judgment is thorough. Yeah. That means he's not just judging the action. He gets down to the depth of the intent of the heart. Yes, he does. That's what's major. See, the earthly judges, we judge the action. Well, you killed, you did this, and you did that. Right. This is, this is, this is equivalent to this amount of time, so on and so forth. This is going to equate to this. What God does, he says, you did this, you did this, and you did that. This is, this is going to bring about this punishment. But hold on. I want to talk about what you were thinking when you did it. I want to talk about what the meditation of your heart was when you did it. I also want to talk about the warnings that I gave you when you did it. I also want to talk about how many times you pushed the Holy Spirit to the side because you figured you had a better way. Let's, let's talk about it because you didn't do this uh, in and of your own weakness. I was actually there telling you not to do it. So when you look at the depth of how he judges, then you look at what hell actually is then it starts to make sense because you can change a person's actions for a season, but God is interested in changing yeah. the heart of a person. That's what makes it different. Amen? I'm going. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. So, yeah, uh, when you were talking about Peter being, uh, you know, they call him uh, Petra, the rock. Yeah. That the rock of that revelation of Jesus Christ being the son of God. Yeah. Being the uh, uh, Jesus Christ or the Anointed One mm -hmm. sent from God to be the appropriate, appropriate I can't even say it, propitiation, propitiation of uh, our sins. Yes, sir. Yeah, and to and that He was our, you know, came to give us eternal life. Yeah, and and and, and allow us to become uh, adopted, like you said, Amen. to become the son, to, be, to become literally the sons of God through faith. Yeah, and and. That, that rock, which is unmovable, that, that mm. revelation, which is unmovable, unshakable mm. uh, faith that, that became uh, the foundation of the church. Yeah. When we receive that revelation as Christians, mm -hmm. we become like another rock, a little rock. Hey. Okay? And uh, like the Bible talks about living stones, yeah. fitly fitted together. Amen. Okay? And that is the revelation that builds the church of of Christ, the anointed one, the mm. one that, and because a lot of people don't recognize that uh, most religions that are not a, a Christian don't recognize the deity of Christ. Mm. Yes, okay? sir. They don't yes, recognize sir. him. They say he's a good man. Uh, he's a, he, he was, a, you know, you know, a prophet, yeah. you know, and, but they will not give him that deity right. that he is due. Yeah. But those that know him by faith. Come on, man. Those that know him by the Spirit, by yeah. that was through the Holy Spirit, yeah. understands just like you were saying how yeah. magnificent Jesus Christ Amen. is as a, as a, as a God. Yeah, he does not, see, you know, he, he, he didn't say, I don't think it's robbery to, to be equal with God. Amen. Because he is God Amen. incarnate in the flesh. Come on, man. So that revelation of understanding that once you get that and then that thirst, that hunger to know more, to get uh, to get the word of God, you yeah. know, because the word, the faith only comes through through the word of God. Amen. And and uh, once we are getting into the word yeah. and hearing the word of God on a you know weekly basis mm -hmm. from the pulpit 
And as you get into it, that builds up that, that understanding more and more, mm -hmm. okay? And, and through that understanding, like, uh, you know, Mr. Alton said, you have that conviction. Yeah. You should have that conviction about, about who Christ is yeah. when you are, you know, disobeying God or, yes, when things, or when you're doing things that you shouldn't be doing. Amen. That conviction should be so strong in you because you understand how powerful Come it on, is. Come on, man. Yeah. So... And yeah, amen. I don't want to keep going. Amen. I want you to have No, you know, no, no. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And so, no, that's yeah. solid. I amen. Go from here no, go, go for it. You had something else to say? Well, yeah. I don't want to try and get off the plate. But here's, okay, so I want to, I have some illustrations of uh, people that became into the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Yeah. I like to find illustrations in the Bible. Yeah. And I, I have one from the, the, the Samaritan woman at the well. Come I on, believe man. it's uh, John uh, 4, uh, 7. Okay, I'm not gonna, it's kind of a lengthy, a lengthy deal, but everybody knows about the, the, you know, Jesus Christ at round noontime was going through Samaria by himself. He took yeah. a stop at the well, and uh, the Samaritan woman uh, came there uh, to, to, you know, pour water up. Mm -hmm. And Jesus was asking her, you know, give me water to drink. Yeah. Okay, and uh, we can read a little bit of that. Yeah. And the one, and the sir. The woman said on uh, verse 11, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where, where would you get, uh, okay, I, I skipped there because he went there. So Jesus answered, yes, if you knew the, the gift of God, which is of God, who is, who is it that asked you for a uh, drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Yeah. Okay. And so what Jesus, the whole conversation was really Jesus trying to get to the, to the point to say, who you are dealing with. Who yeah. am I? Yeah. Because the woman was, you know, she started coming up with things like, you know, uh, Jacob, uh, our father built this well and so forth. Yeah. And, 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 and that, uh, that one day uh, we'll have the, the Messiah that would tell us all things. And Jesus finally said, I am he. Right. Right. And because, and then when she heard that, Jesus began to perfectly speak into her life. Mm -hmm. And when he began to perfectly speak into her life, like, where is your husband? Yeah. Oh, I don't have a husband. Well, I know that. You've had five husbands. Right. And the one you with now is not your husband. Yeah. Then that spiritual discernment began to, uh, to, to kick in with her. Yeah. And, and, once, and once that began to happen, uh, she became alive. Yeah. You know, that's what you're talking about. Come on, that man. revelation of Jesus Christ became alive in her. Yeah. So this, think about it. This woman that has had five husbands, that, that probably has a bad reputation in all her townhood, yeah. would, would he, speak to Jesus, get the revelation of who he was, yeah. and then through that revelation became a witness instantly. Yeah. She got bold. Amen. She became bold yes, sir. In, her, in her conviction. Yes, sir. And she ran back to the town. Yeah. She didn't care about what people thought about her. Right. And she, because that revelation was in her, that spiritual discernment was in yes, her. Yes, sir. So she ran back to the town and, and she began, hey, hey, come see a, come see a man. Yeah, yeah. That told me all Dang, things. That's right. Come see a man. She became an evangelist on the spot. Yeah. Because of that revelation of Jesus Christ. Right, right. No matter, she, you know, old things have passed away, behold, all things have become. She became a new creation there. Yeah. She wasn't worried about her past on, no man. more. Yeah. She wasn't worried about what people thought no yeah, more. She had on, the man. revelation of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Right. Come see a man yeah. that told me all things. Yeah. And the people, uh, they didn't think about what she did before. They're like, whoa, you know, that, that, that excitement, that, uh, that, yeah. that, that depth of conviction took hold of them. And the yeah. whole town, yeah. became, a whole town followed her back. Yes, sir. Oh, my God. Amen. In one hour. <laughs> how long have we been saved? Come on, man. You know, yeah. in yeah. one hour. She yeah. turned yeah. In, in that moment because Come of that on, revelation. Yes, and then sir. she comes back. Yeah. She comes back to the people, and Jesus begins to minister to them and stay with them two more days. All the yeah. people say, now we believe not because of what you said, because we have heard the words from the living God yeah. ourselves. Yeah. And now we want to be saved too. Amen. That's the power Amen. of the revelation of Jesus That's Christ. That's the power of the revelation of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Luke, Luke 8, uh, 43. I love that. I love that. And because, because she realized who he was. When Amen. you realize who Jesus is, that's what changes you. See, a lot of people are getting information, and we got to get past that place. You might say, man, I want to know who Jesus is. That's only going to come uh, with an encounter. What I love about that is that 
You talked about how she became a witness. Well, you can't be a witness if you haven't seen anything. A lot of people say, oh, you need to get out here and witness. Well, yeah. we can't make witnesses out of people who haven't seen him. You understand? We can give you information, That's give you right. booklets and all that, but if you have not had a personal encounter with Jesus, you can't be a witness of his goodness because you have not seen him. Amen? Look at, look at, look at what happens here in uh, uh, Luke 8, 43. We're going to read to 48. And it says, And a woman having an issue of blood 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed of any of them. Mm. Go ahead. Came behind him and touched the border of his garment, and immediately her issue of, of blood stanched. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. It stopped. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee and pressed thee, and saith thou, who touched me? they saying, Jesus, you crazy. Man, everybody's <laughs> touching you, man. What you talking about who touched you, man? You got a whole multitude around you, right? Right, right. <laughs> and Jesus said, somebody have touched me. Now, I mean, think about that. Think about that. You with Jesus. You got all these people grabbing <laughs> on him and pulling on him and stuff like that. Right. And all of a sudden, he just stops saying, man, who touched me? You're like, man. Have you been here for the past hour, man? People right. People grabbing you, man. You know, and he said, who touched me? And then he turns around again and says, who touched me? And look at what he said. And Jesus says, somebody have touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. There you go. And when the woman saw that she was not, saw, saw she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she had, I'm sorry, how she was immediately healed. And it says, and he said unto her, daughter, be of good cheer, mm -hmm. be of good comfort. Mm -hmm. Thy faith hath made thee whole. Go no. in peace. Now stay there. Mm -hmm. Look at what it's saying here. For one, we're in a generation that looks just like that to me, mm. where everybody's pulling on Jesus. Everybody is touching Jesus. Everybody has a revelation. Everybody has an understanding. Everybody got a little bit of knowledge. Everybody is surrounding Jesus. But out of all these people in the crowd, there was only one person that actually touched him. There was only one person that actually connected with him. And the reason being is that all of these people That's were good. fans of Jesus. Jesus is the most popular figure on the planet. You understand? He's going to have a fan base, right? But there's, only, but, but there's something different when you get touched by your child. Oh, man. That's good. There was some virtue that left. There was something different about her touch. It was because she saw something different about Jesus. She didn't just see him as a figure. She didn't see him as a political figure. A lot of these Jews that you read through the text, they thought that he was going to come and set up his kingdom and he was going to rule over Rome and, and he was going right. to shut down the oppression of the Roman Empire. They thought that that's what, what he was there for. That's right. In fact, when he said that he wasn't there, there for that and he was there to die, it frustrated a lot of the people that was his, part of his fan base because they didn't know him. When she saw Jesus, she saw something beyond the physicians. She saw a healer. A lot of us say, man, we believe that, that God can heal us, but first you have to recognize that he is the healer. There you go. You have to recognize that that's who he really is. That's right. And for years, you know, people used to get ostracized or pushed aside because they would say, man, their faith is small. Say, man, you can't say that that person's faith is small because uh, they didn't get healed. That might be true in some situations right. where that person didn't get healed because it was just God's will. But there are also instances where people are not healed because of their faith. Now, a lot of times we, we go in and, and, and when people call for prayer, a lot of times I have to tell them, don't look for me for the healing. You got to look for the healer to heal. That's right. What was Jesus really saying here? Because it was really powerful what he was saying. Everybody was touching his skin, symbolizing a man. Everybody was touching the man, but she got a hold of the spirit because he understood that I'm buried in the skin. I'm not the skin. 
That's right. When you go to your pastors, your ministers, your sisters, your brothers for prayer, you have to understand that it's not in the skin. It's in the spirit embedded in the skin. That's it. If you can tap into that, you can be healed. If you can please God with that faith, you can be restored. If you understand that he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords, you can be transformed and That's renewed. It. Until you understand that, you'll sit from the outside and it's almost like you're getting a fable. It's almost like you're getting some hearsay. I can tell you my testimony and tell you how powerful God is. But it's always something different about when you encounter it for yourself. When you're in your own That's kitchen good. and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit fills the room. That's good. That's when you're good. in your own car and you're driving down the street and you can barely drive because worship is so rich. When you're with your, in your position where you've got your last dime and you don't know how the <laughs> bills are going to get paid, then you see that he is a provider and nobody can take that from you. That's right. You can take somebody else's testimony because you can discredit the witness. If you discredit the witness that said that they saw Jesus in this way, if you can discredit them, so does their, te their testimony also goes with them. But when you've had a personal encounter with God, That's nobody true. can take you from that. Nobody can get you to unsee his glory. Nobody can get you to unsee how he moved on your behalf. Nobody can take how he changed you from what you was into what you are. You've got to see God and encounter him for yourself, amen? What I love about it is that the Bible talks about this scripture or this text in, in, in depth when he says he had to push through the crowd. There you go. That's what was amazing to me. There are so many things about that, that, that Jesus did. The Bible says that it couldn't even be contained in all the volumes of the book. Right. But there are some things that they zoomed in on and they canonized. So that means there was some, some significance in what was going on. Right. The reason why she, she, her, her faith was rewarded is because the obstacles she had to press through. You can say you believe God for something, but your belief is always measured by the obstacles that you have to go through to get to him. You can say, I believe God can take these cigarettes from me. Okay, well, when you go to the store <laughs> and you see those Newport shorts... Those cool filter kings for the old school. <laughs> when you see them hanging on the rack or back there in the back, in your heart you're going to feel this test yeah. where it's like, man, I want that. The flesh going to cry out. But do you believe that the God that you serve is able to deliver or not? The obstacle is the flesh. The flesh going to push against your faith. That's it. The flesh going to make you feel like, oh, man, this ain't working. The flesh going to make you feel like that there's a barrier between you and your deliverance. But if you believe that Jesus is who he said he is, you're going to push past the flesh in that moment because you know, man, I don't even have to have a whole long hour sermon with God to be delivered. I don't have to have somebody lay hands on me for two hours in order to be set free. I don't, I don't have to have everything in my life fail to cry out to him because I know I need him. All I need to do is declare where I am and I can set a point of meeting with God. She, sa she said within herself, if I can touch the hem of his garment. That's Jesus right. didn't tell her, hey man, if you come touch my garment, I'll heal you. Right. She set the conditions because of her faith. She said, if I can just get to, his, uh, get to his garment, if I can just get Ooh, right Lord there, I don't have to even touch his body. If I can just touch what's covering him, I can be healed because I know who he is. But until you know who he is, that type of faith will never be activated in the believer. So you'll be silenced when it's time to get that power that you need to operate in the glory that God set aside for us as believers. Amen. We see a similar story in Matthew 8. Matthew 8 and 5, and we're going to read to verse 11. Matthew 8, 5 through 11. And it says, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, 
and saying, Lord, my servant lieth, lieth at home sick of palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. What did Jesus say? This is what Jesus said he would do. Now pay attention to this. He said that I will come, and if I come, that's what his healing is going to be attached to, if I come. Right. While we're talking about points of faith, right? Right. But then look at what the centurion says. The centurion <laughs> answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak a word only, and my servant shall be healed. What he did was he heard what Jesus said, he said, I know, I know you said that you can come and healing is going to come, but God, my faith is to a point to where I've set a point here. And I believe that if you just speak this, God, then this healing is going to take place. Right. Look at what Jesus said. He says, for I'm a man under authority. Look at what he said. He said literally what he was telling Jesus is, I don't believe you're just a man. I believe that you control all of the elements. That's I believe it. that you're beyond just you coming come to on, touch. On, Again, it's please. another example of faith saying, yes. I don't need skin-to-skin -skin contact from yes. you, God. I don't Amen. need to feel anything from you, God. All I need to do is know. A lot of people are feely-feely with God. Mm. I need to feel you, God. If I feel you, I know it's done. What, what they're saying is, I don't need you to, I don't need anything. I don't need to touch. I don't need you to show up. All I need you to do is speak a word, God. I don't need you to do all the extra. Just speak a word, God, and I can receive it. What God is showing us here through the text is it's not just the ability of you to have faith as much as it is your ability to receive it. That's good. What he's saying is, what level of receiving can you do? Can you receive the idea that God can send a word to your relative in the hospital and heal him? Can you receive that? Can you receive the idea that God can speak a word over your finances and you be set free? Can you receive that? Go ahead. Can you receive that God can speak over your addictions, over your life, over your past, over your brokenness, over your scars, over your torments, over your sleepless nights? Can you believe that if he speak a word... Can you receive it? Yes. And that reception of what it is that God said that he would do is what leads to change. Yeah. Look at what he says here. He says, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, go, and he goeth. Look at what he's saying. This is crazy. And to another, <laughs> come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. Go ahead. When Jesus heard it, he marveled. Mm. Now, this is Jesus standing still like, what? <laughs> like, man. He said, hold on, man. Now, I said I was going to come to your house, and you believe I can do it like that? <laughs> See, when you understand what it's like to be a parent or a father or a mother, when, you're, when your child or somebody that you're caring for believes in you to that magnitude, it makes you want to rise to the occasion. The reason that God might not be operating in your life on that level uh -oh. is because you don't believe him on that level. Are you telling God, hey, look, I know what it looked like, but I know you, my dad. I know what you can do. I know you, my father. You can speak over this and it's done. I'm not worried about it. Oh, another building came in. Hey, I ain't worried about it because my father got this. Oh, yeah, another bad report came in. Hey, man, I'm not worried about it because I know the speaker of life. I know him. I know he can do it. I'm not worried about it. Right. But what happens is, is we put the obstacle over God. We put the issue over him. And the only thing over God is his word. So if you put anything over God, then that means that your worship is in that thing. So you end up bowing before that thing. You end up worrying all night about that thing. And then you start uh, 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 consulting with that thing to give you the thing that you need, and it never will. She was consulting with physicians to heal her. They didn't have the answer. Only Jesus did. The centurion said, look, man, I don't need you to come to my house. All you have to do is speak a word, and I'm able to. To receive that. And look at what Jesus said. He said, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. He's saying, with my people. This was crazy. He said, he said, with all the people that have been crying out for me to come and all of this stuff, expecting my return and all of that, I have not found this level of faith with them. This is an outsider. 
This person don't have access to the books or none of that. What he's doing is he's hearing what's going on, and he said, hey, man, I'm going to go talk to him. If he's doing this, I believe that he can do that. So it's crazy when you start seeing, like Bishop was saying earlier, people outside the church seeing stuff that the church should see. Mm. People outside the church fearing God on a level that the church don't fear him because they understand who he is. But what's happening is there's a turning of the tide. You might see the grave falling away. That's the purging. But then the Bible talks about there's going to be crowds running at the end time to be saved and changed. And the Bible says the people that would sit there, just like the, 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 the Jews would, they would sit there and they would be mad. Why are they getting all this favor? Why are they getting the same thing I got, man? I done been here all these years. Right. Why they get this revelation, this knowledge? That's because at some point in time, God became mundane to you. God became normal to you. You stopped seeking him like you used to. You used to get up early. You used to sacrifice everything to be in his presence. But then after a while, TV became more important. Work became more important. Money became more important. Your spouse became more important. Your kids became more important. And you expect that same attention from God. You got to draw nine to him, and then he'll draw nine to you. Amen? Amen. <laughs> oh, my God. You, you said so much there. I was... I had so many things coming in my head, and you kept going, and some more stuff came in. And other oh, stuff. Man. <laughs> man. But basically, you were saying that, you know, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Come on, man. Come on, God, man. God can only be uh, moved by faith. That's what that Samaritan woman uh, exhibited. And, yeah. and, and I believe that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is the one that compelled her by faith to say, you on, know, man. if I could just press through, the Holy Spirit said, you can yeah. press through, you will be healed if you could just touch the hymn of his garment, which yeah. there's healing in his wings. Yeah. Amen. So I, I want to talk about Paul regarding this. Uh, everybody know about Paul. Paul, Paul wrote probably <laughs> over half of the uh, New Testament, but he didn't start that way. Everybody knows Paul's story. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, he, he, he had a pedigree of all kind of, of the Jews beyond any kind of pedigree mm-hmm. of the law. Could nobody stand up to Paul hmm. and whatnot. And he became a persecutor of, of the Christians. Yes, sir. Because he didn't, he didn't understand. He didn't have that revelation mm-hmm. of Christ. Amen. He didn't, have, he didn't understand. But, and so he, he was uh, uh, just, just very passionate to do, to do harm to Christ and to his people. Yeah. And then, but he had a, he had a, uh, a uh, conversion on the road to Damascus. Hmm. And that's in uh, Acts 9. If you want to drop, put that on the screen there. Acts 9, 9 and 6. Mm-hmm. Okay. And as he, you know, and it's, I'm going to start with uh, 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 verse 3. We got verse 3. <clears throat> am, I, am I doing it? Okay. Yeah. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined around him a light from heaven. Next. And he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Next. And he said, who art thou, Lord? See, he called him Lord. Mm-hmm. And the Lord said, I am Jesus mm-hmm. whom thou persecutest. Come on, man. It is hard for thee to kick against it's the prince. Prick. Next. And he trembling, this is when he got to get the revelation, mm. and he trembling, astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Mm. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Mm. Okay? And from there we know that Ananias, he went blind and he had to be touched mm-hmm. for his eyes to come back open. And, but literally, Paul, doing his thing, I mean, 180 degrees going one way, mm-hmm. Riding on his high horse, literally got knocked off his high horse. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Literally got knocked off his high horse mm-hmm. of, because the law puffed up. Yeah. It puffs up. Yeah. And he became puffed up in who he was. And, and, but when Jesus Christ entered and that revelation, and he literally had an a, a encounter with the Lord himself. Yeah. And when he heard the Lord, he knew. And when that light shone, he knew that Jesus Christ 
was the son of God. Mm -hmm. And all that revelation began to pour into him. Yes, sir. And he says that he began to tremble. Yeah. Because he understood, like you said, where's the reverence? Yeah. Where's the, where's the, Come on, man. where's the, the awe of God? Yeah, yeah. The awe of God. Yeah. You know, and, and, be, and from one moment he was puffed up here. Yeah. But when you get the revelation of Jesus Christ, mm. when you get the, uh, the awe, when you get the understanding, it causes you to just, that's why you, that's why people. Yeah. You, go through the faith process of, uh -huh. of, of getting pricked in their heart by mm -hmm. hearing the gospel, getting convicted about their sins, mm -hmm. and knowing that Christ, you know, paid the price for them, that the only way to, to God yeah. is through your confession and, and receiving him as, as Lord and as Savior. Mm -hmm. and, through that, and through that, Paul, Paul said, what, must, what do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. And because, because of that revelation, Paul no longer was his own. Yeah. You yeah. know, it says, when you're, when you're bought with a price, when, you're bought, when Christ becomes mm. Lord of your life, mm. your, your life is no longer yeah, your man. own. Yeah. You've been bought with a price. Yeah. And I think, Alton, that's what a lot of things are happening with a lot of uh, people in the belief. They still believe when they get the rep, or if they don't have the understanding that their life is no longer theirs. Come on, man. They, they think yes, that, that, you know, they yes, think that, that they still are the masters yeah. of their life. Yes, if sir. Lord means master. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And if Jesus is the Lord of your life, he's the master. He gets to say what he wants to say yeah. and, and pronounce what he wants you to do in your life. Amen. And I think that's why people have a hard time submitting yes, sir. submitting to his, his lordship yeah. and whatnot. But people that really get the revelation, like Paul, Paul didn't take a, take a long time to, to go through the process. Yeah. He immediately said, Lord, what do you want yeah, me to do? Yeah, yeah. He didn't ask, Lord, well, you know, I, I'm kind of struggling <laughs> right now because right. I got all these law degrees. Right, and, right, uh, right. And so can we sit down and have a little conversation <laughs> right. to help me walk through the process right. of understanding this grace? Come on, man. It wasn't no, it wasn't no time. Come on, man. It was instantly because he, because he hey, understood Come on, man. that Christ Christ Jesus is Lord. Yes, sir. Lord of God. And there's no other way to God but through him. Amen. And once he got that revelation, he became a wild hey, man. Yes, sir. And he even <laughs> said to the point, everything I puffed myself up. You know, he read his pedigree. Uh -huh. um, you know, Israelite of Israelites. Yes, sir. Knowing the law, can nobody touch me. About. Uh -huh. He said at that point, he said, you know what? Everything I have known about the law and all this, I counted as dung. dung. Everybody yeah. know what dung is. Yeah. He went from one extreme to the other. Yes, sir. It's only Christ and him crucified. crucified. Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. I love that, man. I love that. When you, when you, when, when you encounter God like that, I, I know how my encounter was. It was, it, was, it, was, it was like that aha moment. It was like you, I always, you know, I grew up in church going back, to, back and forth and stuff like that to where I knew the systems and stuff like that before I got out there and started wilding. And <laughs> It was that moment when I really realized how huge God was. Mm. That was when my heart was open to receiving what it is that he was offering through Jesus. See, a lot of times when we come to the altar, we look at God as this lowly lamb and sheep. And we say, okay, I want the little baby to save me, the baby in the manger to save me. But we don't approach God as if he is Lord yes. of the galaxy yes. and galaxies you know nothing about. As if, he, as if he is the commander of stars. We don't approach him like that. We approach him as he's a man, right? Yes. And, and, and when we do that, we start reasoning with him as, he, as if he's a man. We figure that if I can trick a man or if I can say this to a man to gain some type of uh, remorse, then I can twist him in my, in my way. If I look sorry or pitiful enough, mm. he'll just lean in my direction. But God doesn't function like that. God sees the truth on the inward parts. Yes, and does. then he shows you the truth about yourself from the inward Because you don't even know yourself, let alone trying to know God of, uh, out of the intellect. There's been times when God revealed to me that my intentions for doing the right thing wasn't Ooh. even pure. You could be doing the right thing out of an impure heart. 
And it wasn't that I was doing it to be malicious. I was doing it as if it was just labor, like the checklist. Okay, got to do this. Okay, that's done. Got to do this. So that's done. Got to do. This is not how you're supposed to handle the things of God. You're handling them as a common thing. And this is supposed to be a sanctified walk. That's good. Amen. That's good. Go real quick to uh, Hebrews 11 and 6. You, you call this text. Yeah. We, we, we're, we're very familiar with this scripture. And it says, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. That's good. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, now let's, let's do a, a cross reference. Go to Exodus 13, I'm sorry, 313 to 14. <laughs> said, must believe that he is. And, and Moses said unto God, And I want you to think about this first. You, 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 you're seeing a burning bush in the distance. Now, Moses, he wasn't raised as a Hebrew. Again, he was not raised as a Hebrew. He didn't know uh, all the intricacies or prophecies or any of that. All he knew is that he found out he was a Hebrew, and in his heart, he was trying to stand up for his people. And then he encountered the God of his people. Yes. And look at what it says here. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, because now he's getting sent back to the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent uh, unto me, and they shall say to me, What is his name? Oh, we. This is good. Now, there's a group out here talking about, You don't even know his name, right? <laughs> now, he's asking God directly, I need to know your name. Because if I know your name, then that's going to authenticate my story. That's going to tell them that, oh, yeah, he, he has been talking to him because I got his name. Look at what God's response to him is. <laughs> he said, and God said unto Moses, I am that I am. <laughs> in, in, in Hebrew, that, is, that word is hayah. He said, I am that I am. I am or I haya that haya. What he's saying is that anywhere that you look, I am. Any place that you go, go I am. They say, okay, well, well, who is he? Is he the God of the sky? I am. <laughs> is he the God of the trees? I am. Yes. Uh, are you talking about the God that's raising the dead? I am. That's why he told them, because you got to understand what was happening with the children of Israel. They were immersed in a whole lot of false idols. He said, I don't want you to come introduce me as a new person because they're going to put me on the shelf with all the other idols. Right. I am that I am. And, and I've talked about this before. A lot of times we get hinged on the name of God. And I want you to really think about this. Where did you get your name from? My parents. Where did they get their name from? Their parents. And you go all the way back, their names were given to them by someone else. How do you name somebody that was not created? <laughs> Think about it. How do you name him? As if you can call his name and boom, oh, yeah, yeah I'm going to go ahead and go. What he's saying is that I am whoever I want to be in that moment. I could change my name tomorrow. Nobody named me. I don't have to go down to the state and switch it up. <laughs> That's why it can be Jehovah Jireh. I can be Jehovah Tiskanu. I can be Elohim. I can be Jesus. You know what I'm saying? There is no, no, no box that you can put the God that we say we serve in. If he's bound to a name, that means somebody had to assign it to him. That's right. But he didn't get an assigned name. He names himself. The name that was handed to the Hebrews was who he wanted to be called in that moment. Why you think over in Genesis when he says Elohim? Why, why was he calling himself Elohim instead of, instead of Jehovah there? And you see here, and, and he's, out of all the things he could have called, he said, just tell him I am sent you. Just tell him I am. Think of you walking up to a people that, that said that they knew God the entire time. <laughs> They've been listening to him the entire time, waiting on the prophecies the entire time, and you walk up and you say, they say, okay, 
Well, I've been talking to, you, to your God. Who? Who God? Your God. What's his name? He said, I am. I know he's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I am. We ain't never heard of him. But then when they started to understand through the miracles that were happening. See, that's why you can't just have a name or a title. You got to have some power. You can come up talking to people, talking about, yeah, I know God. Well, show me. Show me, you know. How do you know God and your life ain't changed? How do you know God and you still sitting here smoking weed and drinking with me just like before you start going? Into, how do I know you know God? The way that they knew, what did, what did Paul say? He said that, that I don't speak with enticing words of men's wisdom, right. but in demonstration and in power. What are you demonstrating to people? Can they see mm. the power dripping That's off it. of your life? That's Can it. they see that you've been enveloped by the power of God? Can they look at your life and say, hey, man, hey, that dude right there has been in God's presence. I don't know how he knew what he knew. But he knew some kind of way, and I can tell by the way he living that he knows God, that he's Amen. seen him, that he's talking to him, that something about him is new. They can feel the weight of God's words when you speak because you've encountered him, even That's more it. so that you've been filled with his spirit. Amen? Go real quick to Acts 17 and 23. Amen. And I want to look at the, the conditions. I want to look at the conditions of the church. Look at Acts 17, 23. It says, For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, look at what he said, I found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God, whom therefore you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Amen. Doesn't it sound like the church? Not, not the remnant, not the actual church, but the church at large. They're worshiping an unknown God. They don't know him. You show me somebody in a text that encountered Jesus and was not changed. Exactly. Either for the good or for the bad. Exactly. You say, well, what about Judas? Judas got worse. That's what happens to people when you encounter Jesus and play with them. You ain't going to stay the same one way or the other. You are not going to stay the same. When you encounter Jesus, you are not going to stay the same, period. If you go in there and you go to, you go to God and you got a sincere heart and you won't change, you will be changed. You will be renewed. You will be refreshed. You will be a completely different person. God will do a work in you. Yes, he will. But if you encounter Jesus, and this is why it's important to be aware when you're in his presence. If you encounter Jesus... And you choose to betray, ignore, disrespect, dishonor, and you think you're going to be the same, you're wrong. You'll end up worse. You'll wonder, man, why am I atheist? Why am I even entertaining witchcraft now? Why, am I, why do I hate the church now? That's because the whole time you were in the presence of the authentic God, and you played with his glory. And nothing in God's presence leaves unchanged. What did he say about the stone? He said that I am the stone. If you fall on me, you will be broken. That's right. But if I fall on you, you will be crushed to powder. What he's saying is that you will not encounter God and not be changed. One way or the other, you're going to be changed. So he said that, that, that they were on an altar with the unknown God. Yeah. But they were worshiping him. In the church today, we got people lifting their hands all over the globe. Right. And have not encountered the true and living God. But the world stands back and look at them as spokespeople for the kingdom. And then they get the idea that, okay, their God is not real because there's no change. There's nothing significant about their life. Me and Bishop was talking about um, uh, this one guy. What's his name? Uh, Andrew, um, Andrew Tate. <laughs> and, and he was trying to, saying he was trying to walk with Christ for a minute and so on and so forth, but now he's a Muslim. And they asked him, they said, man, how did you go from Christian to Muslim? Right. He said, because, man, there's no fear of God. 
And I was like, man, now that was, when I, when I saw that, I was like, man, that's crazy that he would say that. Right. He said, there's no fear of God amongst Christians. He said, they pretty much do whatever they want to do. They say that there's a reason to fear them, but their life does not say that. If I came running, if I came uh, uh, running in the building laughing, and I said, man, it's people out there with armed, I mean armed, and they're shooting people that's walking into the parking lot. Would you believe that was true if I came in here laughing? No, because it doesn't look authentic. Right. But see, we'll tell people, man, if you don't accept Jesus Christ as Lord, the end is death and fiery judgment. On, but then your worship is goofy. Your lifestyle is goofy. Every time you mention him, it's goofy, it's fun, it's games. It's not real. It doesn't look serious. But you'll tell them that as if it is authentic. But then when they look at your life, it looks like a game. They're not going to believe you. That's why it's important that in this day and age that we get a real hold of God. If you don't know Jesus, start asking him, God, reveal yourself to me. Yes. God, show yourself to me. God, I didn't feel you. I didn't, I didn't get it. I don't understand it. God, I'm missing you. God, I need you. You got to press in, press, press past the flesh and say, yes. God, until you reveal yourself to me, I'm not going to stop seeking you because I have to know you for myself, God. Yes. The question that will be asked once you encounter Jesus is, is he God? Is he actually God? And that's what we're going to talk about next week. Amen. 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 Look, thanks for, for tuning in to the live stream. Again, my name uh, with Bread of Life East. My name is Minister Alton West uh, with my brother. Minister Raymond Crockett. God bless you. God bless your family. God bless America. Pray for our president three times, and we'll <laughs> see you next time. God Amen. bless you.